It's great to be here celebrating the birth of Christ with you. I want you to get your Bible out if you have a Bible. If not, we're going to help you with that. Just put your hand up and one will be brought right to you. And when you get a Bible in your hand, open up to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We're going to read two verses this morning from the beginning of John's letter. This letter of John is John's eyewitness account of the life of Jesus Christ. The person of Christ, which he describes the person of Christ and the work of Christ. And so let's open to John 1, and we're going to read verse 1 and then verse 14. They go together. We're going to focus in on verse, primarily verse 14, but John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. John, the disciple of Jesus, writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jump down to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. What I want to do as we begin is I want to take a few minutes as we strive to kind of focus on and understand what John is writing here. It's going to help us if we understand a connection that he makes here in verse 14 to the Old Testament storyline of Moses and Moses leading the people of Israel after they had been freed from bondage in Egypt and or they wandered there in the wilderness for 40 years. There's a word here uh, in the Greek that John uses. We're going to miss it in the English. A few of your translations might read like this in 14, that that we be held, that, that the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, not dwelt among us, but tabernacled among us. And so we're going to look into the history of that Word because John had that in mind without question, when he wrote this. And the Jewish readers who read this in the first century would have been thinking about this connection to the Old Testament. So let me just explain that for a minute. At the beginning of Moses leading the Israelites over that 40-year period of time, as they left Egypt, they went to Mount Sinai. And Moses climbed that mountain, and there on the mountain... He met with God. And one of the things that God gave to Moses, in addition to the Ten Commandments, God gave Moses a plan for a tent or a tabernacle that was to be built. A very precise description of this tabernacle and how everything was to be fashioned. And what God intended to do was dwell among the people of Israel in that tent or that tabernacle. That tabernacle was a representation of the most significant reality for that nation, that Jewish people, that is, it is what, in their mind, set them apart from the rest of every other nation on the face of the earth. Because in the center of that tent or that tabernacle, there was an inner room, an inner sanctuary, and it was called the Holy of Holies. And that room was kind of divided off, kind of curtained off, called the Holy of Holies. And in that room there was a furnishing, one object, the Ark of the Covenant. 
it's a, it was a, a wooden chest that was overlaid with gold and it had a lid on it, uh, overlaid with gold. And on that lid were, on each end of the lid, kind of facing the center of the lid, there was an angel on either end with wings outstretched that came together and touched each other in the middle. And there in that holy of holies, here's the significant reality of that that tabernacling, that dwelling of God, that God actually dwelt there in a manifest way. There was a light that hovered above the Ark of the Covenant uh, under the wings of those outstretched angels there, a bright light that hovered there. It was the visible, manifest presence of God dwelling among that people. That was highly significant. No other nation on the face of the earth had anything like that. That's what gave that room the title, the Holy of Holies, because the Holy God dwelt there. John, borrowing from that history, using that same language, he says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us pointing back to that historical reality. So just think about that related to that Israelite nation, that Jewish people in the Old Testament. Most privileged of all the nations on the face of the earth. They had God, the King Eternal, the universal creator, the life giver and sustainer, the incomparable majesty, the holy one of eternity, residing with them, dwelling with them in that inner sanctuary in a manifest way. So John takes that concept from the Israelite history. He brings it forward into his story about the person of Jesus Christ. And what he says about Jesus here is given to describe what we have in Jesus. Look at verse 1 again. John says, uses this word, capital W, the word that became flesh. And he says that that word was with God and was God. He's talking about Jesus, calls him the word in the Greek, the logos, and says that word is actually God. And in verse 14, he says, here's what that word, here's what God did. He became flesh. He became Humanity. So here's the first truth in John's story of Jesus, and it's simply this Jesus is God. Jesus is God. That's the opening declaration of the disciple of Jesus. He who was the closest to Jesus. An eyewitness of his life and his ministry, his death and his resurrection. He opens by saying, Jesus Christ is God. God who became flesh in the person of of Jesus. And what did he do in the flesh? He dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. So here's what John is saying. John is saying that in his day, beginning with that life of Jesus, that there is a new day that has begun for human history, a new era 
of humanity was ushered in by the coming of Jesus. God no longer dwells exclusively with one nation of people. God has now come to dwell on this earth in a brand new, far more significant way. And so that leads us to the second and primary truth in the story of John here. And it's this. Not only is Jesus God, God became flesh and dwelt among us. God's physical, visible presence did not remain hidden behind a curtain that was experienced only one day a year. This was true in that Old Testament tent or tabernacle of Moses. God was not just this light that dwelled there behind the curtain that was only experienced or seen one day a year by one man, the high priest, on a specific day, the Day of Atonement, when that high priest went behind that curtain with the blood of a spotless, sacrificed animal to enter into the presence of God to atone for the sins of the people. That was the reality then. John says new reality, new reality. Something far more significant has happened. And what has happened is that God has come in human flesh. The primary emphasis of the story of John and the central truth of the Christmas story is that this story that we're celebrating here today is the story about the God of eternity becoming the flesh of mankind so that he could come and dwell with humanity. In the birth of the child Jesus, we have God in human flesh. If you do not see that in the Christmas story, you are absolutely missing the entirety of the Christmas story. It is the great truth that gives the rest of the story its meaning and its impact. It is a story about God becoming man. But how, how much greater is this manifestation of God in the story of Jesus than the Jews, the Israelites had there in the Old Testament in the tabernacle of Moses. You see, to them, God just came to be with them with a the visible light. To us, from the coming of Jesus forward, God has come to be one of us. That is infinitely greater, infinitely greater. You see, the tabernacle in the Old Testament, you know what that was for? It was a prophetic picture pointing the way to a far greater reality. It was a, subst it was a shadow that pointed to the substance of the coming of Christ. It was the promise of a greater reality that was to come, and then when Jesus came, He was that greater reality. And so, here's what we need to do to come to know God, to enter into the worship of God through relationship. We do not need to go to the tabernacle of Moses. That's where they had to go if they wanted to meet with God. Where God dwelt there was in that holy of holies. And all they could do was come close. They couldn't even go in. Only the high priest one day a year could go in. And to come and worship God, we don't need to go to the Jewish temple later that was uh, the ongoing reality of Moses' tabernacle there in Jerusalem. We don't need to go to that temple to worship God. Here's what we need to do. We just need to do what the shepherds did. We need to come to the person of Jesus Christ. We need to do what the wise men did. We need to come to that one that was born. 
2,000 years ago, that God-man, we need to do what Thomas, one of his followers did to worship him. We need to fall before him and exclaim as Thomas exclaimed, my Lord and my God, because that is who Jesus Christ is. He is God in human flesh. And so, we just need to do what many millions have done since His coming. We need to come to the incarnation of God. That's the miracle of Christmas. To God becoming man so that man could get to know God and enter into a relationship with God. Let's look closer at the words of John here. Their meaning has a treasure. John says in verse 14, the word became flesh. The idea here in the Greek, the word became flesh. Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. <coughs> it does not mean that God came in the appearance or likeness of a man. It's much stronger than that. It doesn't mean that God came as an apparition without any tangible substance. That was a heresy that was being promoted in the days of John when John wrote this to refute that heresy. It doesn't mean that God is just visually similar to humanity. And know this, it doesn't mean that God becoming man became less than God. It does not mean that. God did not step down from any of His divine attributes when He became man. God retained all of the infinitude of His perfections that He had always had when He became man. So there was no loss in God when He became man. So what does it mean? It's this incredible miracle. You know, some, some theologians, many theologians call this the greatest miracle of history. If you want it in a big theological term, it sounds smart to people, you can just talk about the hypostatic union. Why don't you say that? Hypostatic union. Yeah. Well, you're really smart. Let me just explain that for a moment. It means this, Jesus, who is one in nature with God, accomplished this great or greatest of miracles by his own willful transformation, a work accomplished by his intentional action. It's this, the second member of the eternal Godhead, the Son, the Christ. He united His divine nature with a human nature. But you need to understand a few particulars about that to understand what this miracle really consisted of. Though we cannot in any way fully comprehend it, we can believe what is taught and that is the Scriptures and that is this. In the joining of His divine nature with a human nature, Jesus miraculously did that in a way that didn't confound either nature. Here's what I mean by that. There was no intermingling or mixing so that the man became more than we are as human or the God became less than God has eternally been. They retained the full reality of their nature so that in Jesus, here's what we have. We have two distinct natures, a divine nature and a human nature that is perfectly united in one person. That's the miracle. That's the astounding miracle of Christmas, this miracle. 
God who from the moment of His incarnation, incarnation forward was and forevermore will be fully God and fully man. Fully God, all of the attributes and the realities that He has eternally possessed still has and fully man. All the weakness and the frailty of humanity, He entered into our reality with all of that minus sin. That's what we have in the miracle of Christmas. The God who is man. Fully God. Fully man. So what does that truth hold for us? Why did He do that? Let me just give you a few answers. There is a long list that could be included here, but just to get you thinking along these lines, let's just talk about that implication of that stupendous miracle of the incarnation. Why did God condescend to become man? Number one, Jesus came and became the God-man to keep His promise to defeat Satan and sin. Let me take you to that promise. The miracle of that promise is a promise that was given at the very beginning of human history. It's the long-standing promise promise of the Bible, the longest standing promise of the Bible. It was on a dark day, the dark day for human history, in a beautiful garden, a garden called Eden, when sin broke into a perfect world that God had created bringing with it pain and destruction. And in that event, at that moment, here's what God did. God promised to Adam and Eve, now broken by sin, He promised to them that a seed was going to come from the woman. And that seed was going to be a man. And that man was going to crush the head of the serpent of Satan. That's the promise, the very beginning promise on that dark day that broke into the brilliance of the perfection of human history and ru ruined it. The promise that Jesus, the Christ, would come and He would defeat Satan and sin. That's why He came. Secondly, Jesus came as the God-man to reveal God. Here's how the writer of Hebrews describes Jesus in His coming. Hebrews 1.3 Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. Jesus is the supreme revelation of God, the perfect revelation of God, because in Jesus, all of the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, it says in Scripture. So Jesus came to keep His promise and defeat Satan and sin. Jesus came to reveal God. Number three, Jesus came to die to rescue sinners. That's why he came. That's why God became man. He came to die to rescue sinners. You see, Scripture says this, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It says this, that we in our sin are storing up wrath against ourselves for the day of God's wrath. You see, God is a God of justice righteousness, holiness. God will not let sin go unchecked and sin deserves and will receive the punishment 
of the holy, just, righteous God. And so something had to be done. What, hum- what was humanity's greatest need is that it needed to be rescued from its greatest threat. And what is the greatest threat? It's the eternal wrath of God. So the question becomes this. If that's God's determined position against sin and we are all sinners, who could there be that could rescue us from the power and judgment of the omnipotent, holy God? And the answer is this. Only God could rescue us from God. And so what He did is He became man so that He could enter into our reality so that He could have our flesh and live this life and take that flesh to the cross so that He could offer it as a sacrifice for the sins that we committed. Him being sinless Fully God, fully man, sacrificing His human flesh to pay the penalty for our sin. That is the only way that God could rescue us from His own judgment by taking the penalty for our sin upon Himself. He had to do that in order not just to rescue us but to be true to His judgment because if He did not act against sin, He would not be God who is a just, righteous, holy God. So that's the dilemma, the impossible dilemma that was solved by this great miracle of the hypostatic union. It's that God became man to save us from God. He went to the cross in order to do that. Last thing that I'll say here, and then we're going to do something tangible to emphasize God becoming flesh. But the last truth I just want to mention is that God condescended to become man so that He could, as Jesus, guarantee us heaven. You see, there is one master key that unlocks the gate of heaven for you. Only one. And it's a master's key it is the key the master Jesus himself forged and he forged it with the spikes driven through his flesh in the cross it's a cross shaped key that opens the gates of heaven only that key can open the gate of heaven for you. And when you put your trust in the person of Jesus Christ, He turns that key and opens that gate for you. And once it has been opened, never throughout an endless eternity can it ever be shut for you. And once you're there, never can you be cast out. The gate remains eternally open and you are always welcome and you belong there because God joined His divine nature with a full human nature so that He could take that human nature to the cross, willingly offering that flesh as a sacrifice for your sin. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to participate in communion. Communion involves an element of bread and juice that is representative of the body of Jesus who is God and the blood of Jesus who is God. God in human flesh taking that flesh to pay for sin so that we could be forgiven, cleansed of sin, united with Him, having heaven opened for us.
So let's continue here now looking into this verse a little deeper. John chapter 1 verse 14 and look at the remaining phrases in this verse. John writes, John 1 14, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. John says, We've seen His glory. John, just consider that for a moment. John was a constant companion of Jesus Christ during His three plus years of ministry. For three years, John walked beside the One who was sinless. Just imagine that. Try to imagine that. We can't really. For three years, John listened to the words of the one who, quote, spoke as no one had ever spoken before. Let me just give you a few examples of that. The crowds. The crowds were delighted and awed by the teaching of Jesus. They hung on His words. The religious leaders, you know what they were? They were confounded by His wisdom and knowledge. When Jesus was just 12 years old, He amazed them as they spoke with Him with His insight into the Scriptures. And then when Jesus was 30, those same religious leaders, they became incensed by His popularity. And although they made every attempt to try to discredit Him by plying Him with questions and trying to trap Him in His words, the only thing they accomplished was they revealed their own foolishness next to His infinite wisdom. And then think about the demonic spirits and the words of Jesus. The demonic spirits were subdued by the authority of the words of Jesus. They cowered before His presence and submitted to His every command. John beheld that. He heard all of that. And then John, for three years, was an eyewitness of the power of Jesus. Let me just give you a few examples. John was one of the ones that drank from the jar at the wedding feast that had been water that was, been, that was turned into incredible wine. John watched as Jesus asleep in a boat in the midst of the fury of a violent storm was awakened by His fearful followers. And John saw Him stand up and look into the fury of that storm and immediately command and accomplish its stillness and its silence. And John, John was one of the privileged few who were taken by Jesus into the home of Jairus, the home where his 12-year-old daughter lay dead. And John was there And he saw Jesus walk over to that lifeless form and take her hand in his and say to her, little girl, I say to you, arise. And to the overwhelming joy of her father and quote, to those who were immediately overcome by amazement. 
the little girl arose. See, John was an eyewitness of the power of Jesus. One more. John was an eyewitness of the victory of Jesus. The one that saw him stripped, mocked, ridiculed, beaten beyond recognition, nailed to a Roman cross, and hanging there, breathing his last unto death, that same man, a few days later, and over an extended period of time, saw Jesus on numerous occasions, full of vibrant, unconquerable life. He saw him win the victory. John saw the one who was laid in the tomb ascend into heaven. You see, John was an eyewitness of all of that. And John says, we, referring to his comrades, we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. But don't stop there. He qualifies what he's meaning. You see, just thinking about those amazing realities, the being a part of that group, listening to the teachings of Jesus, witnessing the miracles of Jesus, seeing his unlimited power and his absolute victory, we can think, oh man, wouldn't it have been great to be them? to live with them, to be a part of that band, that group of followers that witnessed firsthand all of those things. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, we today are not in an inferior position to those disciples of Jesus Christ because what John emphasizes here, he qualifies the glory that he's talking about. What stands out to the one that did hear and did see all of that was not these feats of power. Here's what John says. We have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father. And here's the qualifier to that glory that he's emphasizing. Full of grace and truth. That's the emphasis. And that is what we can see as clearly today as John and the followers of Christ of that day saw it. We can see in the pages of Scripture through the revelation of the Spirit of God and the story of Jesus, we can see the reality that Jesus Christ was the God-man who was full of grace and truth. So let's just talk about that for a minute. Full of grace. Consider just one way in which Jesus is shown to be, proven to be full of grace, and that is in His relationship in the face of sin. I'm going to fail at adequately explaining this, but let me just give you a few examples of the fullness of the grace of Jesus. He was full of grace toward the very first rebels. I've referenced them a moment ago. You see, God created a perfect world and He gave mankind every blessing. Adam and Eve existed in a, as sinless beings with a perfect existence in a perfect paradise environment with an intimate relationship with God. And yet, what did they do? What did we as humanity do? We rebelled against the lavish benevolence of God. And yet, this Bible says... 
Christ in that moment was full of grace and truth. In fact, the fullness of His grace even preceded that moment because here's what Scripture says. Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. The plan of salvation was already in place. And with God, the determination to do something, whether it has happened in time or not, is already an accomplished reality. And Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world before there ever was that first sin of Adam and Eve in the garden the sacrifice of Jesus for that sin had already been determined by the unchangeable decree of the Almighty Eternal God. So the fullness of Jesus' grace even preceded the first sin. So His full grace to the first rebel. Secondly, the fullness of His grace can be seen as we reflect upon the increase of sin in the world. You see, we as humanity didn't stop with that first sin, did we? Are you awake? Did we? No, we did not. We multiplied sins beyond number. And how does the fullness of Jesus' grace reveal itself in glory in the face of innumerable sin. Let me give it to you in the words of Paul. Paul said it like this, where sin increased, grace superabounds. Where sin increased, grace superabounds. Sin is no match for grace. In fact, the blackness of sin becomes a backdrop upon which the vibrant colors of the grace of God can be seen for the beautiful things that they are. It's this blackness of sin as the canvas upon which grace stands out and is seen to be full. So, Jesus' full grace as the God-man seen toward the first rebels, Jesus' fullness of grace seen to increasing sin, and Jesus' fullness of grace seen, one more, in the lives of the greatest of sinners. The greatest of sinners. Just think about that for a moment. There are sinners, certainly all of us fit into this category, there are sinners who fail in moments of weakness. In the frail flesh of humanity with a heart bent toward sin, temptations entice us and times we give way. So there are sinners like that. And then there are sinners that are on an aggressive mission of absolute rebellion. Have you ever known of those? haters of Christ, antagonists to the core, enemies of the gospel armed with an arsenal of evil. And on the canvas of history and on the canvas of the Word, there is painted incredible portraits of the fullness of God's grace in the lives of men like that. Let me just give you one. He is on a journey. He's making his way from Jerusalem to Damascus. He's a hater of Christ. He's on a mission of murder against the followers of Jesus. And as he pursues his course of absolute rebellion against Christ, he is apprehended by Jesus and redeemed. 
by Jesus. It's Saul whom Jesus appeared to him as he is prosecuting his hatred and his persecution against the followers of Jesus. And in that moment, the number one enemy of Jesus on the planet encountered the God-man, Jesus Christ, and that number one enemy when he encountered the fullness of the grace of Jesus He became the church's greatest treasure. He became the great preacher. He became the prolific author of Scripture. He became the church planter extraordinaire. He's the one we read and study today to understand the person and the work of Christ. What do we have there in the life of Paul and in the life of other great sinners down through history? We have examples of the absolute fullness of the grace of Jesus Christ. But John says he's not only full of grace, he's full of truth. Full of truth. You see... It is the grace of Jesus that saves us, and it's the truth of Jesus that transforms us. And those whom he saves by his grace, he transforms by his truth. Because he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That's not a statement about your willpower. That's a statement about the will of God, the decree of God, the unfailing work of God. His fullness of truth. Let me just mention a few points and then we're going to do something special at the end. The fullness of his truth is proven by his fulfillment of prophecy. One, so many prophecies about the Savior that was to come. Detailed prophecies in the hundreds. Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of all of those. Just, I just encourage you today, read one chapter. It's not the Christmas story as you think of it at all. It's from Isaiah, the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53. And here's what the prophet Isaiah does in Isaiah 53. He paints a picture 700 years before the event of the crucifixion of Jesus in detail. You want to see the one who is full of truth? Look at Isaiah 53 and then read the crucifixion account and you're going to see the one who did exactly what was promised even to his own agony. Jesus in his fullness of truth is proven by his perfection of life. He lived a perfect life of love. He gave comfort to the brokenhearted, hope to the helpless, help to the needy. He lived absolutely selfless and absolutely sinless. And then number three, Jesus' fullness of truth can be seen by his resurrection from death. You see, he said, I'll give you one sign that I am who I am. He claimed to be the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. And then he said, I'm going to give you one sign that proves it. And here's the one sign. I'm coming back from the dead. Coming back from the dead. John says, uh, Roman, Paul says it like this in Romans 1, that Jesus was proven to be the Son of God by His resurrection from the dead. Jesus is full of grace and He's full of truth. So here's the encouragement for you this morning. I beg you, I plead with you Do not just let Christmas be a little spiritual blip in the year where you turn aside for one day, for one moment to think about God and go back to a godless existence the rest of the year and maybe another peek in at Easter. Do not do that. 
If you are looking at it that way, you are missing the complete truth of the Christmas story that leads to the Easter story. The truth is God entered this world in a man, Jesus, fully God, fully man, and he did that. He did that, not to give you a neat story to celebrate in a festive occasion, a day, a year. He did it to change your life. He did it to change your eternity, to save you from eternal wrath and to give you an eternal glory and then before that eternal glory to use you right here. Listen, Jesus is so full of grace and truth that there is nothing that you could have done that puts you outside of the reach of His grace and His truth. There's no sin too black no hole too deep that His grace cannot reach into. If you will look to Jesus and trust in Him, He is able to save to the uttermost those who trust in Him. And He will, not only able, He will do it. He will do it. I implore you, look to Jesus. He is the answer for your life and the promise for your eternity.